Hello, my name is Liam Knight and I am a doctoral researcher at the University of Birmingham whose research in English literature specialises in dystopian fiction. Now today I'd like to ask, to what extent does Kazuo Ishiguro's novel Never Let Me Go depict a dystopia? Let's find out. Right, so first of all, if we are going to evaluate whether or not Never Let Me Go depicts a dystopia, it's probably worth our time establishing what a literary dystopia actually is. Now to do so, we're going to pay attention to the scholarship of Gregory Clays, one of the foremost experts in all things dystopian. In particular, we are going to look at his 2016 book, Dystopia, A Natural History, which is a fantastic place to go if you are interested in the traditions and histories of both real and imagined dystopias. Writing about literary dystopias, Clays writes that they imagine regimes characterised by extreme suffering, fear and oppression, the cruelties imposed by people upon other people. This sets the genre apart from post-apocalyptic fiction, in which human life is difficult because of the apparent end of the world. In order for a book to depict a dystopia, it must be people who are responsible for making other people's lives incredibly unpleasant. Clays also identifies two major types of dystopia. The internal dystopia, in which everyone's life is pretty rubbish, and also external dystopias, in which mostly outsiders to some sort of system, regime or society have their lives repressed and controlled. Now this comment from Clays also brings to mind the idea that literary dystopias often feature societies that are clearly hierarchical. There are people in charge who do not suffer and there are those who they rule over who definitely do. Scientific developments feature throughout literary dystopias as well. However, what makes this genre different from sci-fi is that the question is not what the science produces, but is instead about its negative impact on humanity. That is to say that whereas sci-fi might focus on the science, on the ability to travel through space, on the wonders of having robots, or on the science behind miracle medicines, for instance, literary dystopias often wonder what the cost of these scientific developments are for humanity. For every apparent positive gained by new developments, literary dystopias imagine their unpleasant consequences. In concluding, Clays suggests that, ultimately, literary dystopias project negative futures that we do not want, but may get anyway. Now this projection is important. Literary dystopias don't necessarily imagine brand new things, but instead take already existing or already imaginable things to extreme and usually negative ends. In saying that we may get anyway these negative futures, Clays suggests that it could already be too late for us to avoid some of the futures that literary dystopias depict. So according to Clays then, literary dystopias depict imagined, but not necessarily totally unrealistic, negative futures. To what extent then does this apply to the world depicted by Ishiguro in Never Let Me Go? So to begin with, let's think about why the world depicted in Never Let Me Go might be considered a dystopia. To start, let's consider whether or not the Hailsham students and their fellow clones lead oppressed or heavily controlled and restricted lives. I would say that their lives are restricted in a number of ways. First of all, they are much shorter than those of their non-clone counterparts, with the clones seemingly completing in their 20s and 30s. Secondly, we find out that the clones are completely unable to procreate and have babies, which constitutes a biological restriction of sorts. Thirdly, it appears that clones are very much prevented from gaining certain types of employment. Despite Ruth's assertion that she will one day work in an office, it seems that this is ultimately a fantasy, and she becomes a carer. Finally, the clones seem to have little say about when it is that they begin their donations. Once they are told that it is time for them to undergo this process, they cannot actually prevent it from happening. 
Now let's focus on whether or not a societal hierarchy of sorts is implied throughout the novel. There are a number of instances where it is clear that the clones are othered and are not seamlessly integrated into the story world society. This is perhaps most clear in how Madame clearly avoids and apparently fears them, but is also clear in how the clones are segregated in childhood and are kept apart from their non-clone counterparts. It is clear then that Kathy, Ruth, Tommy and the rest of their fellow clones are then outsiders, and it seems like they are the group that are made to suffer for the benefit of the rest of society. In this story world, the entire purpose of having clones in the first place is to have a supply of organs and other body parts that are ready to be transplanted into non-clones who are in need of them. Missing some of their organs, donors lead an increasingly compromised life, and whereas the full extent of their suffering is debatable, I think we can agree that they are indeed suffering at least a little bit. Clays suggests that literary dystopias often depict the negative impact of scientific developments on humanity, and this is what I would like to focus on next. Much of the novel seems preoccupied with debating whether the donors are human or not. Now this debate doesn't really reach a definitive conclusion. On the one hand, the donors seem flawed and very human. They are capable of falling in love, having enormous bust ups and producing written and visual art, which apparently proves that they have souls. On the other hand, they have no parents, are completely unable as a group to become parents, and are viewed and treated as animals to be butchered or crops to be harvested by the rest of society. It's complex. But if they are indeed humans, or human adjacent, does their mistreatment constitute a negative impact on humanity? After all, it is in the name of science that these human lives are maimed and cut short. Last of all, I would like to revisit Clay's assertion that dystopias project negative futures. Clearly, this future is negative for the donors. Kathy and Tommy's desire for just a few more years together in which they could freely experience their love for each other is born out of the fact that their existences are inherently cut short. With such shortened lifespans, the donors are unable to lead full lives. Additionally, what are the implications of creating and harvesting life so freely? Towards the novel's end, it is revealed that other facilities that rear donors are much worse than Hailsham and are almost akin to factory farms. We also find out about the Morningdale scandal, named after a scientist who started to develop ways of creating abnormally powerful and intelligent children, doing something so unnatural that it terrified the public. In a world in which life is so easily created, modified and harvested, what is preventing people from playing God? Alright, so there are clearly elements of the story world depicted in Never Let Me Go that are dystopian, but what is the argument against it being labelled a dystopia? Well, Gregory Clays states that literary dystopias depict regimes that are characterised by extreme suffering and fear, and it is this that I would first like to think about. Kathy, Ruth and Tommy, as well as the rest of the donors, do not appear to actually fear their fates. Throughout the novel, the characters seem fairly resigned or accepting of them. Ruth even remarks that she was pretty much ready when told that it was time for her to begin making her donations. As much as Kathy and Tommy seek a much rumoured deferral, they both acknowledge that this will only prolong the time it takes to reach their final fates, rather than change them entirely. And when told that deferral is just a myth, they do not fight it or argue against it. And aside from Tommy's eruption of anger in the field at the end of the novel, they just accept their fates for what they are. Additionally, despite their donations, the clones do not seem to 
suffer enormously. Ishiguro never details which organs are taken when during the donation process, although it is implied that the necessity to life of the organs tends to increase as the donations go on. It is likely that the first donation or two sees donors lose a kidney or part of their liver or some of their blood or, or maybe even part of one of their lungs, given that you can still live after donating these things. Regardless, it is clear that these donations are not exactly easy. Both Tommy and Ruth are shown to be considerably weaker in the final third of the novel. However, the donors do not seem to live a life of suffering. Kathy and Tommy appear to be able to lead relatively normal and active adult lives, and although Tommy is prone to fatigue or prefers low energy activities, his life does not seem to be one of constant excruciating pain. Secondly, I want us to consider if the impact of science is wholly negative in the novel. Now on the previous slide, I wondered if the treatment of the clones, cutting their lives short basically, meant that the novel depicted science's negative impact on humanity. The development of clones, reveals Miss Emily towards the end of the novel, meant that people did not die from cancer, motor neurone disease or heart disease, and probably plenty of other illnesses and conditions that are currently uncurable today. Can we really say that a future in which people do not die from such ailments demonstrates science's negative impact on humanity, or is it in fact much more complex than that? Last of all, I want to revisit the comment made by Clays that dystopias project negative futures we do not want but may get anyway. In the case of Never Let Me Go, I agree that a realistic projection of human society is made. Writing in the early 2000s, it is likely that Ishiguro drew upon recent scientific developments, such as the cloning of Dolly the Sheep in 1996, the first successful mammal clone produced, or the numerous breakthroughs made in stem cell science at the turn of the millennium, and then took them to negative or pessimistic places in order to create the story world of Never Let Me Go and maybe even warn of the perils of scientific development. But the question remains, is the future that Ishiguro creates actually unwanted or all that negative? Can the creation of human clones and the harvesting of them be justified by the fact that ending their lives could prolong another? Is creating and destroying life okay in the name of overcoming terrible illnesses like cancer? Simply put, are the negatives of this world outweighed by its positives? So to what extent does Never Let Me Go depict a dystopia? Well, it's hard to say. Although we do not get the full-blown dystopia that we might see in George Orwell's 1984 or Animal Farm, or Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale, it's pretty clear that things are, to an extent, pretty rubbish for the donors, and certainly their lives are somewhat dystopian. Now to close, I'd just like to leave you with one final quotation from Madame at the very end of the novel, and that might help you to decide whether or not this world is indeed a dystopia. Speaking to the grown-up Kathy H about the time she saw her dancing as a child, Madame says, When I watched you dancing that day, I saw something else. I saw a new world coming rapidly. More scientific. Efficient, yes. More cures for the old sicknesses. Very good. But a harsh, cruel world. And I saw a little girl, her eyes tightly closed, holding to her breast the old, kind world, one that she knew in her heart could not remain, and she was holding it and pleading never to let her go. That is what I saw. It wasn't really you, what you were doing, I know that, but I saw you, and it broke my heart, and I've never forgotten. The question remains then, is a world in which such pure life is created only to be harvested and destroyed later on. Is that a good world or a bad world? I'll leave that for you to decide.